Are we rolling right now? We are, absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Larry McCormick. <laughs> I can't tell you what a treat it is to be here with you. You are one of my uh, idols. When I was growing up and Frank was teaching me how to drum, I mean, your name would come up all the time and said, really? boy, if you could see those Skyliners, if you could see the Gabarina Corps, if you could see the, the Riley Raiders, you know, mm -hmm. the things that Eric did with those drum lines, you just won't believe it. So you were always held way up here. Well, that's nice to hear, you know. Yeah. I'll accept flattery any time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start by telling me a little bit about your beginnings? No, this is true. And I was only about four or five. I don't know why, but I was fascinated by these big uh, five-gallon gas, uh, five gasoline cans, you know, the, the big square ones, you know. Yeah. And when they were empty, they were laying around the lots. I used to beat on those things. <laughs> Who knew it would lead to this? <laughs> yes. A personal interview with Larry McCormick. <laughs> Who knew? But really, I was how it, here, here's how it happened. We started to go to some of these little competitions for the first time. Yeah. And, uh, boy, we were goggle-eyed. We never saw anything like this. All different cores, different uniforms. And it was, uh, oh, this is great, you know. Yeah. And naturally, we heard Orteo playing. And naturally, they, they played marches and far better than we did. And um, we went to one. And this, is, this was the turning point for me, at least. And maybe, maybe I was about 13 at the time, yeah. by, by this time. And we went to this contest in Maspeth, which was a few miles away. And uh, we were co to compete in the afternoon against a couple of junior courts. Oh. It turns out there was a senior contest scheduled for the evening. And the but as we got close to the place, there was drumming going on. Now this was the important part. These fellows were playing on drums, rope drums. And they were doing something they were going starting very slow with things, like an exercise. I didn't know at the time what was happening. Yeah. They start very slow and go faster and faster. And man, these guys could wail. They were really hitting that drum. I never heard a sound like that before. Mm. You know, they weren't piddling away with your fingertips like we were doing, you know. <laughs> and look at this. There were a few of them doing that. They start very slow, go fast, and then go very slow again. Then after looking around and, and talking to them, they were playing rudiments, I found out. Rudiments, out. what are they? <laughs> rudiments. And these, these boys were very good at it. They weren't boys, they were young men. Yeah. And I saw some dr drummer running with his rope drum to, to get down to the drum stand before it closed up. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was looking at Frank Arsenault, a very young Frank Arsenault, no, who was a member of the St. Francis Corps from Connecticut. There, the first time I ever saw him. Yeah. 1937, I believe it was, wow. in Greenwich, Connecticut. He, had a, he didn't have a rod drum. He had a rope drum. That's uh. over there, and he, they put him on the stand immediately, and he had to start running down the long roll, and I was still way back. But he started, and that form, and that sound, bump, 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 bump. And uh, he started closing that roll down, and it got faster and faster until my eyes almost popped out of my head. I couldn't believe he was going so fast without losing the volume. Yeah. Even, there was no, no flutter at all. It was perfectly smooth. Yeah. And uh, he was impressive. And then he had to play two more rudiments. That was the rules in those days, the long right. roll. Everybody had to do the same thing. Right. The long roll and whatever the chosen rudiments of the day were. And how were they chosen? They were picked out of a hat. There was such a thing as rudiments, and boy, after that, I knew where to go, right to the music stores. I tell you, it must have been within the week. I was down in, in the Manhattan area, in the, you know, in 42nd Street area, buying books on drumming. Uh -huh. That's right. Now that I know the word, the magic word was rudimental, rudimental drumming. Yeah. And incidentally, when that cork assembled and played inside, it turned out to be the Charles T. Kirk Fife Drum and Bugle Corps, number one standstill drum corps, senior-wise, in wow. the entire state, probably. Wow. wow. I, I was just fortunate to see that at the time. And yeah. It turned everything around for me. And uh, they played the Downfall of Paris, which I didn't know what they were playing. Yeah. You know? yeah. And you couldn't hear the fife because it was, a, it, was, it was all echo. From uh, were they basically a role model for you that oh, you yes. saw them? Oh, yes. Or did you become a part of that group? It was a role model, and that's where I wanted to be, because oh. I knew that was where to go. Okay. 
And remind me, I want to show you a, a core picture of the Kirks in 1938, and I'm in that picture. Really? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but the, but the, oh, and here, here, this is an interesting shot. Now, if you see here, there's a drummer right about here. Yeah. That's a Kirk drummer. That's me. Yep. That's me playing. Yep. And I'm being judged by this, the back of this fellow here, who okay. happens to be Earl Sturtz. Incredible. The leading instructor of the time, top-notch judge. Of course, I have a number of experiences that I recall. I'm going to share one with you. 64, oh, 5? Yeah. Was, okay. Now, you weren't at this contest, I don't believe, but mm -hmm. it was a Mission Drum Show in Boston. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I was going to be judging on the field, and my other execution judge on, at that time was Earl Sturtz. Oh, okay. And it was the first time I ever encountered him face-to-face uh -huh. because -face, he had been held up, you know, like he's a deity up here sure. from Frank. Correct. He said, Sturtz is the master. And oh, yeah. So when I walked out in the field and Earl said, uh, hi, Larry, uh, how do you want to do this tonight? <laughs> I about died. <laughs> and what was your answer? The master <laughs> asking me how he wants to do it. I, I was just flabbergasted. I don't yeah. remember what to say. The form was everything in running down the room. And his precision, motion was absolute, had to be flawless. Yeah, but we, yeah, well, we were going to these big championship state field days, okay. New York State and, and Connecticut State, and right. we'd see the Connecticut cores, and we got to know the great drummers up there. I think you mentioned Frank Arsenal. He was a superstar drummer, yeah. one of yeah. Earl Strait's pride and joy. Yeah. Not only him, but others. And we would watch them. I would. Oh. And as, 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 as pretty darn good as we ha were, you know, yeah. the kinetic guys, the kinetic guys were better than yeah. we were. Oh. They, they really were. Oh. And Frank Arsenal, when he went west, being able to demonstrate not only how to do it, but how to do it at the top of its excellence, oh, the, he turned I mean, it around. He, well, he brought drumming to the Midwest. That's 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 what I mean, he accomplished. He really no did. question about it. And, he opened and that's up. what uh, that's what turned the Midwest into being competitive, drum corps wise. Certainly did. If Certainly it wasn't did. for Frank, we wouldn't have done it. That's right. Yeah. That one of the major pieces that I think in this whole activity and movement, that whole Connecticut kind of power system changed dramatically somewhere around the end of the 60s, early 70s, when Fred Sanford, the uh, Santa Clara oh, yeah, Vanguard, that, that, and yes. they started pulling the sticks down oh, yes. and started playing close to the head. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the full range of expression kind of changed. There was, there yeah. was very little expression, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Cavaliers, for years and years, used to play Riley's Street Beat that I mean, <laughs> everybody's got to play Riley Street Beat. You yeah, know, that to. was one of yours. That was one of mine, all yeah, right. Yeah, indeed. I always liked swing music, and I was... It, on top of the big bands and the good swing drums. I love that stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, that, that street beat is basically from Sing, Sing, Sing. Really? Yeah. The, the famous Krupa thing. I, I loved it. And when I went to Riley, as though I was playing that, but I put a counterpart of the tenors against this seat. Right. And the, the two things came out, and it came out sort of like a swinging jungle beat. Yeah. <laughs> And you're right, that I never had anything of mine copied so much yeah. <laughs> the wrong way. Other cause, you know, their version of this thing, you had to go like this with it and move with it, you know. It was, it was different. It was good. I yeah. liked it, too. <laughs> <laughs>